It's time. Good evening. Good evening. You pray with me. Father, thank you for how real you are to us. God, thank you that you can take the hardest times in our lives and turn them around. God, you can take the, the dumbest things that we've done and cleanse us and, and change us, Lord, and make us different, and only you can do that. And we just want to say to you, we're so very, very glad that we can say that we belong to you and you are ours. And so, Lord, would you speak to us tonight? Touch our lives, challenge us, comfort us, be all that we need you to be. And thank you that really I don't have to ask that. That's what you love doing, being all that we need you to be. You are the great Jehovah, the becoming one. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, it's been about two years as we move into these chapters since the closing of chapter 42. Joseph had been at that two-year mark before. Two years of waiting mark. It looks like God's finally going to answer and then he does nothing kind of a mark. You ever been at that place where it just looks like, wow, it's time, God's working, and then you wait. And Joseph had been there before. Remember when he was in prison and he interpreted the butler's dream. And he said, you know, when this comes to fruition, just like I said, remember to tell the Pharaoh, remember. And he waited because the butler forgot. He forgot until his memory was triggered. And that's, that's really comforting to me to know that if it's important, God will trigger my memory when I have forgotten things. And then in one day, just in one day, when Joseph was released from prison and elevated to be the second in command of the entire land of Egypt. And here in Genesis 43, we find Joseph in that waiting time again. Because in the previous chapter that we studied last week, after at least 20 years, Joseph's brothers appeared before him to buy grain. And the chapter ends with his brothers returning home, minus Simeon, recounting their trip to their father. And the kicker, telling their dad, and the ruler of Egypt, second in command as a ruler, told us, don't come back unless you bring your younger brother. And remember Jacob's response? To Jacob, a no-brainer, didn't need to pray about it. My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead and he is left alone. If any calamity should befall him along the way in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. You know, when you and I pray, not only does God give us bigger answers and different answers and better answers than we would have in our own thinking, but he shifts our focus, doesn't he? Because all too often before you and I pray, what's our focus? Me. And when we pray, he gets a hold of us and he takes us and, and has us look up to him and our focus becomes him or our focus becomes others. Because look at that. You would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave if something happened to Benjamin. Wait a minute, what about Benjamin? Not just his gray hair would go down to the grave, but his whole body would go down to the grave. And Jacob doesn't even seem to be interested in that. Now Joseph had sent his brothers back home for the purpose of them bringing back Benjamin, the younger brother. And I'm sure Joseph thought, it's got to be soon. After all, he had two things his family needed. He had the food, and he had their brother Simeon. Should have made them come back pretty quickly. And we're told in chapter 45, which is next time we meet, that this time was two years into the famine. I'm pretty sure Joseph thought they'd be right back. But Joseph had learned by experience that two years waiting can be part of God's plan. And often part of his purpose in waiting is, is not that he's slow, but because he needs time to get you or me ready spiritually to do the work that he wants to do to best accomplish that work that he has for us. And my guess is, and it's just a guess, that Joseph sent them away pretty confident in his plan to get them back, having no intention to keep his brother Simeon in jail all this time. And I would guess that during that two years, Joseph found himself humbled 
again, dependent on God to bring around the fruition of, of these plans. Because can't you just see it? You know, he had authority. He started being able to be that kind of man that whatever he says happens. Comes up with a plan, a fantastic plan about the food, and it happens. And he comes up with this plan of the brothers. I've got Simeon. I've got food. Go get your younger brother and come back. And then he waits. And you know what happens when you and I have to wait when we have our own plan? We go back to being dependent on God, don't we? Too often, you and I, we come up with a plan. It's like, I, I, it's almost like we don't need God. My plan, perfect plan, no brain are going to work. And then it's not working. It's like, what do we do? Oh, God, please help me. And I think Joseph was in that place. God, I want to see my family. I want reconciliation for my family. And I, I thought this was such a good plan. God, I need you to work. Look at Romans second. We're frozen, I think. Okay, there we go. Romans 5, 3 to 5. And not only that, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope. You probably see with that word worketh, I'm working from the old King James, and because I like this word experience, now we're moving into New King James again, and hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. So we, we've got this trail that happens when a tribulation occurs. We go, a tribulation, God's intent in a tribulation, if we seek him in it, is he wants to work patience in us, and once he works that patience in it, that's supposed to work experience, which should work in us a hope which does not disappoint us. Now, where do we, you and I usually stop at this list? We've quoted this scripture all the time. We stop at patience, don't we? And we warn people, you want patience? Remember Romans 5, if you want patience, you get it from having trials. You know, and it's like, I mm, don't want patience that bad. No, no thanks. But we've missed Paul's point. See, we rejoice in tribulations, not because of them, not for them. We rejoice in what God can do in a trial if we seek him in it, not in the trial itself. And in a trial, we can learn patience. Now, patience is the quiet endurance of what we cannot, but we wish, could be removed, which is an endurance in hard times because, because we know they are of God or the calm waiting for his promised good till his time to bring it about. So patience is being under a trial and knowing, all right, God says he can bring good out of this. God says he can, he can make me different because of it, and I'm going to endure this trial and hang in there in this trial until it's God's timing to bring about his purposes in it and having that attitude of, Lord, don't take me out until you do that work that you want to do. But then there's more. If we allow the Lord to work patience into us, then he takes us the next step, experience. And that's why I used old King James here, because experience is really, for me, it's the best word here. It's kind of a hard word to explain, though. It's been translated or, as proof or character. You might say it produces in us a sense that God's word works. So we have a trial, and it produces patience in it. And when we hang in there in a trial, what do we discover? We discover, wow, God really does what he says he will do in a trial. He really does comfort in a trial. He really does give peace. He really does change us and make us better. He really does draw near to us. So we have this experience that, that when the trial hits, it's like, okay, I've gone through a lot of trials before, and you know what? When I patiently endure them every time. God comforts me. Every time he's there for me. Every time he keeps his promises. And then experience works hope. As we experience his faithfulness, it produces in us a sure hope. Remember, biblical hope isn't an I hope so hope. It's a sure thing. That the next time the trial hits, we've learned. I can endure it. I will get through it. 
And then we're told that hope does not disappoint. In other words, we will never, ever be disappointed because we trusted God in a trial. Never. That's an incredible set of verses. Even in the toughest of times, we will never look back and say, didn't work that time. God wasn't faithful that time. Shouldn't have trusted God that time. So Joseph had walked with the Lord long enough that he'd learned that experience. The fact that God would come through in his perfect timing. God had proved it to Joseph before, and he'd prove it to him again. So this is so crucial. You know, if you and I would walk in this truth that when the trial hits, I can have hope. I can trust that God is going to be all that he is going to be. He's going to do something good, eternally good. Now, last week I made the statement that God cannot do anything bad. And you don't get to see each other's faces, but it was fun for me to look at your faces when I made that comment. And I said, it's not just in his character. He can't. And clearly we see in the life of Joseph, God not only allows bad things, he purposefully caused bad things to happen. So the confusion of, or the misunderstanding here is his purpose. No matter what he sends, no matter what he allows, he always has a good purpose. See, he's holy. Holiness is, is perfect. He can't do anything bad. But see what he's concerned about, the good he's concerned about is our soul. He's trying to make you and I more like Jesus. Now, if that isn't an, of interest to you, to be more like Jesus, to have him protect your soul and get your soul to heaven, then you're going to say, yeah, God does bad things. But if you want what he wants, if your good is his good, then what he, who he is, what he has declared is true. God cannot do bad things. So two years into the famine, food Joseph had sold to his brothers was gone or just about gone. So what's a fearful father to do? He's got to feel like he's in a real jam. They need food. They desperately need food. But to get food, Jacob says he's got to risk calamity. In his mind, he's got to risk losing Benjamin. So this interaction proceeded between Jacob and his sons. Jacob saying, no way can't take Benjamin. And the son's saying, that ruler guy, he said, we can't go get food unless we bring Benjamin with us. But hunger won out. And I wonder if Jacob thought of the day when his brother Esau was hungry. And he greatly compromised because of his hunger. And he, and he sold his birthright because of his hunger just for a bowl of stew. And maybe Jacob thought, I remember when my brother compromised to eat. Am I doing that and risking the life of my son? And as I was reading about that portion of scripture when Esau sold his birthright, it said he had been working in the field all day and was weary. And I thought, okay, that's interesting, but it really has nothing to do with our, our lesson. But I couldn't seem to let it go. It was like somebody just needs to hear this statement. So don't make decisions when you're weary. Esau did. And it was a big mistake. And you and I, sometimes we get tempted to make decisions when we're so tired and we're so shot. And it's just a, for, it's for somebody here or somebody this morning, just don't make decisions when you're weary. Now Judah, he even took a, a jab at his dad. Look at verse 10. For if we had not lingered, surely by now we would have returned the second time. In other words, if we wouldn't have waited so long, we could have gone and been back by now. So hunger went out, and Jacob told them in Genesis 43, 11 to 14, and their father Israel said to them, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down a present for the man, a little balm, a little honey, spices, myrrh, pistachio nuts, almonds, things that were plentiful in Canaan. So it would have looked much like this, a lot of sacks with a lot of really good stuff that was produced in Canaan that, that Egypt didn't have a lot of. And then he said, 
take double money in your hand and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take your brother also and arise. Go back to the man. And may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your older brother and your other brother and Benjamin. If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. And I want to just park on that statement. If I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. Jacob's statement, meaning if I'm deprived of children, I'm deprived of children. Well, obviously, no one wants to be deprived of their children. But so much of our fears are when we think, like Jacob. We think about how calamities are going to affect us personally with little thought for how others are affected. You know, recently I was talking to someone else that does speaking about leaking in a message, and I think I've talked to you before about it, and when I say leaking, it's, you know, when you're speaking and all of a sudden you say things about yourself that really doesn't help the people you're talking to, or you have a pet peeve about something and you start sharing it and work it into a message, but it's really your agenda. And, and you know, she said something nice to me. She said, you're really good about not doing that. And I said, well, it's in my notes a lot. But when I finish preparing my notes, I always sit down with the Lord and I'll say, okay, where did I leak? And I'll go through them and sometimes you'll go, right there. That's your agenda, right there. Take it out, you know. Um, so I said, I'm just smart enough to ask the Lord to point them out. And so I can take them out. And then I said this, I said, really, it's not that hard. All you have to do is be other-minded. And it, and it works for a message, it works for conversations that we have for, with one another. You know, if we don't want to leak and say things about ourselves and be all about ourselves, you know, it's not like I can't talk about myself, it's just think about others, be other-minded. And that doesn't happen. And Joseph was, Jacob was not other-minded. Really, when you read most of the stories about Jacob, Jacob was typically about Jacob. That's the kind of guy he was. And here he is anticipating his own grief, not the welfare of his youngest son or his imprisoned son, Simeon, or really any of his sons. And so we find Jacob a fearful man, not even seeking God for his will. You ever been in that place when you're afraid? I don't want to ask God because I'm pretty sure what he's going to tell me, and I don't want to do that. And that was kind of where Jacob was at. You know, no, I'm not taking the chance of being hurt again you can't take my son. So the brothers took the money and the gifts. Jacob had used that maneuver before when he was at that place where he was going to meet Esau after several years and was pretty fearful about what Esau's brother would do. He says he brought gifts. Esau didn't want them. He said, well, what's this about? I don't want these. And neither will Joseph. See, integrity really doesn't want to be bought. There's a good thing to remember about God. You and I can't buy God. Not through gifts and not through good works. We know Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 very well. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. See, we shouldn't be trying to buy God's favor, which is his grace. It's insulting to God when we do that. If you've earned it, it's no longer grace. The brothers did as Jacob directed them. And when they got to Egypt, they stood before Joseph, who told his steward, take them back to my house, prepare a really nice meal for them because I'm going to dine with them. And fear gripped them. And when they got a chance, they tried to explain the perplexity and finding the money in their sacks. And the steward, uh, presumably quoting what Joseph said to them, he said, Peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. In other words, I know you gave the money. I have it. I got the money. The money that went back into your sacks was not the money you gave me. God gave you that money. Now, he's not saying the money just came down from heaven, but the provision of that money, the source of it coming into their sex, it was God's idea. It was something God wanted to do. As they'd stated in the last chapter when they discovered the money, remember they said, what has God done to us? 
And the steward's acknowledging, God did it to you. But it's a good thing that God did. In chapter 42, we read, when they saw it, they responded in fear. So what is the steward telling them? You don't need to be afraid. Same circumstance here. They thought God was doing something bad to them. Stuart says, no, God's doing something good. They thought it was a reflection of God's wrath or his judgment. Stuart told them it's a reflection of God's love and his grace. I wonder how many times you and I think like that. We think God's doing something bad to us when all the while he's doing something good and we spend our time worrying rather than trusting him. And then the steward brought out Simeon, gave him water, washed their feet, fed their donkeys, you know, and they really had to be wondering. And verse 25 tells us they made the present ready for Joseph. But when they bought him the presents and even bowed down to them, he didn't say a word about the gifts. It wasn't important to him. He just wanted to know, how's my dad? Or how is your father? And then he saw Joseph and he hurriedly tried to find a place, or excuse me, he saw Benjamin, and he hurriedly tried to find a place where he could run and weep, and he ran to his chamber and he wept there. Weeping is a good thing. You know, tears are good for us, and we need, need to slow down sometimes and just cry, because they fester when we keep them inside. They do good things when we let them out and when they, we put, keep them inside and we stuff them, what happens? You know, they just grow bigger and more powerful. And when we allow ourselves to weep, especially before the Lord, yeah, this hurts, this is hard. The power is, is so stripped when we do that. So after Joseph wept, he washed his face and came back out, still restraining himself, still not letting them know who he was. And then Joseph began seating them. Egypt was one of the most racist nations or countries, societies on earth at the time. They believed that Egyptians came from gods and everyone else came from some other sources. And there was absolutely no social mixing with foreigners. So it's interesting how God used that prejudice for his, his people. Jacob's family was going to greatly multiply in the next 400 years as they lived in Egypt. If God had allowed them to live in Canaan, they would have simply assimilated into the corrupt and godless people of Canaan because it was starting to happen. So God not only had to take this family of Jacob out of Canaan, out of this corrupt environment, but he had to put them somewhere. He put them in a country where the people would have nothing to do with them so that this nation that would be a nation of Israel remained pure. And he sent Joseph ahead to make the arrangements. So the Egyptians sat at another place. Brothers were seated according to their ages, and the, and the brothers, of course, were astonished. And we were talking this morning in leaders' meeting about setting the, the brothers according to age and a younger brother looking at the one that's maybe just a year older and saying, you know, I told you you looked a whole lot older than me, you know, and, and all the sibling rivalry that probably went on. But they were astonished. Benjamin was served five times the amount of food as the brothers, and apparently there'd been a change. Because we're not told the brothers were envious. We're not told it bothered them. It says they drank and were merry. And that takes us to the end of chapter 43. Have you ever found yourself in a place where you knew you were supposed to forgive someone, but there's no change in their life? And you knew, and you thought, if I forgive them, they're going to stay the same as they always have. They're going to hurt me again. They're going to do that sin again. Are you wondering how you could ever be in a place of trusting them again? See, Joseph was right with us there. Forgiveness, a command. Forgiveness is not making someone pay for what they've done to you. Forgiveness is putting away bitterness, anger towards a person. Forgiven, forgiveness is that choice to extend love, to extend kindness towards someone who has caused us harm. But trust, see, trust is different. 
we are only commanded in Scripture to trust God. Ever think about that? Scripture never says, wives, trust your husbands. Friends, trust your friends. Why? Because that Scripture wouldn't work, would it? We'd end up being pretty hurt if we ended up trusting one another because none of us are 100% trustable. Because you and I, we all have those tipping points, those places where we, we do something, we do well, and we're pretty trustful, but then all of a sudden we, we do something, we fail one another. And I found the only way to really avoid those tipping points is, is to stay right in the center of God's will, not to get on the edge. And I have this picture of Zoe when she was just 13 months old in, in Israel, and I remember Tim setting her on this this rock, and, and where does a parent set a child when they set them on the rock? You know, it's right in the middle. You know, or a bad parent to set them on the edge. They're going to tip off. And we would be wise to not stay at the edge of what we think might be God's will, but look, God, what's right in the center of your will? And when you and I walk in the center and live in the center of his will, we can be trustable, more trustable, but never 100% trustable. We're not commanded to trust people. You see, Joseph should and could have forgiven his brothers. But these guys are family, you know? And he wanted his family back. Joseph wanted reconciliation. He wanted a restored relationship to be truly reconciled, truly restored. Something needs to happen. There needs to be repentance. There needs to be remorse over sin that kind of genuine repentance and remorse that results in a changed life. And I'm guessing Joseph's goal and all that he was doing was that the family's broken relationships be restored. Now, for that to happen, Joseph needed to kind of stand back and watch, see how his brothers were really living. See, if he would have exposed himself or revealed himself for who he was, how do you think the brothers would have reacted? If he would have said, hey, very first time they met, I'm, I'm Joseph. Oh, Joseph, we're really sorry. We're going to be on our best behavior. And he could have watched them and not really known what they were like. But he was able, as he did this, as he did not reveal himself to them, he was able to stand back and watch their behavior to see if they'd really changed. One key word in this chapter is shalom. It appears four times in this chapter. It's translated in, uh, into different English words. But the steward greeted the nervous brothers with the word shalom in verse 23. And then Joseph himself asked after their shalom or well-being, but it's shalom, and the shalom of their father in verse 27. And the brothers responded by assuring Joseph of Jacob's shalom in verse 28. It's like you and I ask someone, how are you? You know, it can be a flippant statement. Or it can be a statement where we really want to know the answer. In the same way, our answer to that question, sometimes we seriously answer it, sometimes we answer flippantly. I mean, how many times have you been asked, how are you? And you don't want to say anything about talk about your life or anything, you're fine. And you know you're just dying inside. Or on the other side, you ask someone how they are, you really don't want them to say anything, but fine. And, and so this word here, the shalom, is kind of that same feeling when you're inquiring about someone's shalom, their well-being. How are they doing? It can be a serious thing, or you can answer flippantly. Jacob wasn't experiencing shalom. They said he's fine. He was a wreck. The shalom or the peace or well-being of the family was shattered long before Joseph got thrown into that pit. Their envy and hatred and inability to speak shalom or peaceably to him was before that. This family had no peace. They, they weren't well. It, it was even in the pursuit of shalom, find out their well-being, that Jacob sent Joseph to the brothers that day they threw him in the pit. So Joseph yearned for shalom for his family. In this story, Joseph gets it. Many of us won't in this side of heaven get that total shalom in our family. But see, this story reminds us God's got the power to restore families. God's got the desire to restore families. And the only thing that prevents families from being restored is is our 
choice, man's choice. So true repentance is marked by change. And Joseph, he's looking for a change in his brothers. Not perfection, though. We can't look for that. Not even complete change, but a desire to change that we see reflected in a change. Take the prodigal son. You know, I'm sure when he got back to the father, when he got back home, he didn't totally get it yet, you know? And I think the older brother knew it, you know? He's still got so much he's got to learn. I can just almost see the gears running in his brain. He was a suspicious one. He probably saw all those remaining flaws in his brother, but the father just welcomed him home. And so I want to kind of make a list as we go through the, the rest of the chapters here of some of the indications of true repentance, but I don't want to take a hard line with it either. So the first indication of true repentance is a right response to past temptation. Joseph made sure Benjamin received five times the food of his brothers, and it didn't seem to affect them. Now, to clarify, old temptations, even if we're repentant, they may still be a temptation to us, but we'll choose to react differently. And see, they chose to react differently when Benjamin was preferred. And we'll add more to the list as we go through chapter 44, but... Joseph commanded his steward again, fill the brother's sacks with food and put each man's money in his sack. And he added a command this time, put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest. And the steward did just as Joseph told him to do. And as the morning dawned, we're told the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. You know, oh, what a glorious day that had to be, you know, just thinking, wow, this trip went a whole lot better than we thought it would. You know, look, we, we got Simeon back. We got to go dine luxuriously at, at the home of the guy that's second in command of the whole country. They treated us really, really well, and hey, we still have Benjamin unharmed, you know. This was a good trip. This is a great day. All is well. Shalom. I bet they were walking down the road, you know, laughing, talking about how the trip had gone, singing praise songs, you know, hallelujah, isn't God good? What a relief. God's so incredibly faithful. And then suddenly, they saw the steward racing towards them. It says he overtook them, and he spoke the words Joseph told him to say to them, why have you repaid evil for good? And he accused them of taking Joseph's silver cup. Not good. They'd been hunted down and accused of taking something very precious to one of the, the second in charge of the land. Not good at all. So you ever had a day like that? You know, sweet day. Everything's going really, really well. And it's praise the Lord, he's so good. Happy day, and all of a sudden, just wham. Sudden change. As of yesterday, I, I have a new phrase for that kind of a day. From here on out, I'm going to call it a wear red day. Yesterday morning, I got up early and went to Kelly's house, to my daughter Kelly's house, to get her three kids ready for school. And they were really excited that Grandma was going to get them ready. And so Audrey, who normally wakes up in not a good mood, not a good attitude, you know. She woke up and saw my face and she just beamed, you know. And, and she's our fashionista of the family, you know. Clothes are very important, even though she's only five. And jumped right up, went upstairs and got her outfit on and came out of her room, you know, just really proud and showed me she had a jean jacket with a flower on it, a cute little jean dress and tights and socks that match, shoes that match, you know. Everything was good, you know. Audrey was happy. She let me brush her hair. We fixed it. She was happy with what I did. She, she came over to the counter, got up at the counter to eat breakfast. I gave her whatever she wanted, you know. Happy day. And she's just smiling and eating away and talking. And, and then her brother Ty walked in. And he said four little words. And he said, it's wear red day. Audrey had blue on. And you should have seen the look on Audrey's face. All of a sudden, that happy day was no longer happy buzz because calamity had struck. It was wear red day. 
and she was wearing blue. And all of a sudden, that new jacket and the pretty little dress and the matching socks, all wrong. And the boys saw it as soon as Ty said it, you know, and they know. When Audrey starts her meltdowns, there's no coming back. And, and so, so we're watching, and the meltdown's starting, and Ty said, Audrey, just wear red socks. And, and to that comment, you know, Audrey said, I don't have red socks. I'm wearing blue, and it's wear red day. You know, it's just, it's an awful day. Her problem was fixable. Most of the time, wear red days aren't fixable, are they? You know, days where things are going well, and all of a sudden, They're not going well at all. And, and God knew it was going to be a rare, wear red day while Audrey was getting dressed. And yet he still let her put on that dress, still let her put on that jean jacket, and think it was going to be a flawless day. And see, actually, yesterday was a wear red day for me, too. Um, not just one thing, but within a half hour, just slam, slam, slam. Three, three things from three different sources just, just hit me. God knew it was going to be a wear red day for me. Even while I'm laughing at Audrey and her response to her wear red day, he knows you're about to have one too. You know, are you going to have a meltdown? How are you going to react to your wear red day? And I know, I know, I know he knew that was just a little bit further in the day for me because he knows everything. But I also knew for another reason because. The last couple days, I started getting verses emailed to me, you know, verses from people saying, the Lord's put you on my heart. Here's this scripture about tribulation and, and peace and tribulation. And, you know, I've, I've done, I've gone through this enough. I've got the experience enough that I know, uh-oh. I start getting texts. God put me on your heart. You, you on my heart. I'm praying for you. And I got someone say, I have a friend that hardly knows you. And they woke up at four in the morning and they're praying for you. And I thought, oh, no. Here it comes. I'm about to have a wear red day. You know? But I've learned something about that. I've learned that, that God doesn't give me those verses about peace and perseverance and trials. He doesn't wake up people and prompt people to pray for me because life is about to go real smoothly. So I receive the verses and the text with that feeling of, uh-oh, it's about to be a wear red day. Why doesn't God just prevent wear red days? He's got the power to. Rather than have people pray that I have strength in them, why doesn't he just take them away? Wear red days are bad days. God knows that. But he's doing something in those wear red days in our lives. And he was doing something in the lives of Joseph's brothers. And it was a good thing he was doing. The ensuing conversation between Joseph's stewards and Joseph's brothers began with the brothers claiming innocence. And then an attempt to prove their innocence. Look at verse 9. With whomever of your servants it is found, let him die, and we also will be the Lord's slaves. So the steward said, Now also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my slave, and you shall be blameless. Not a bad deal. And to the brothers, a very safe deal. They, they were innocent. At least they were innocent of stealing that silver cup. And sure enough, the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. So back to Joseph's house they went. In verses 16 to the end of the chapter, we see Judah displaying many indications of repentance. And as a result, next time we meet, when we study Genesis 45, we'll see that Joseph could no longer restrain himself. And a very sweet reunion took place. So let's go back to our, our list. Indication of true repentance. We have that right response to past temptation. And then there's a desire to make things right by asking. And what I mean by that is look at verse 16. And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak or how shall we clear ourselves? Remember on the day of Pentecost? Peter's message of great conviction, he said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. They didn't try to figure out what they were supposed to do about that. Their response was, What shall we do? So repentance very often comes and says, What's important to you? What shall I do to clear myself? 
What can I do that will make you feel better about what I've done? And thirdly, there's an admission of sin. Still in verse 16, God has found out the iniquity of your servants. And I love this because what unrepentance does is it points out all the times they did the good things. Well, I wasn't bad there, and I did this good thing, but repentance says, I've sinned. What I've done is wrong. Yes, they didn't steal the cup, but certainly there was sin in their lives, and God was exposing it. I haven't had a traffic ticket in a while now, but I still remember the last time I got one, and I, I first felt so wrong. Do you know why I felt wrong? Because I remember distinctly a car zipping past me really fast that didn't get pulled over. I got pulled over. And so my feeling was, hey, that's not fair. You should have got that guy. And then, of course, I was reminded of all the times that I should have been pulled over and, and, and wasn't. And God found out their iniquity. He exposed it. They were not the honest men they claimed to be. Sure, in this case, they were honest, but they were not honest men. Admission of sin. Even sin you haven't been caught doing shows repentance. You know, and I did this, and nobody even knows about it, but I want to be right before you and before God. That's repentance. Accepting responsibility. Look at the end of verse 16. Here we are, my Lord's slaves, both we and he also with whom the cup was found. Remember, the steward told them, only the one whose sack had the cup. Everybody else can walk away blameless, could go free. But see, they knew they had a part in an iniquity that God was exposing, and they admitted it. And then acknowledge the offended party's right. Look at verse 18. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. Judah acknowledged Joseph was fully within his rights to make him pay. Relating accurately to an event, in verses 19 to 29, Judah accurately related the events, the conversations with Joseph. See, unrepentance tweaks a story to the person's benefit, but repentance tells it straight. Willing to take consequences, we look at verse 33. Now, therefore, I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go with his brethren. And then lastly, concern for others, verse 34. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me? Lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. What a significant change that was. They had shown no concern for their father at all when they brought that coat of many colors back to him with the blood stains on it, letting their father think that a wild animal had ripped his son apart. No concern at all. That's change. Now, there are other indications of repentance, but this is what Joseph saw. And these are not ironclad evidences. See, because just like anybody can be good for just a little while, anybody can be repentant for just a little while. And what you want to watch is time. You want to watch to see because only God, when God does the work of repentance, there's a, uh, over a period of time, there's consistent walking in these things. Repentance very often is, I'll take it, I'll do whatever you want, and then days later, hours later, how much longer do I have to put up with this? When are you going to forgive me? Time. This is what led Joseph to falling on his brother's necks and kissing them that we will see in the next chapter. You see, people can change. The gospel isn't just about Jesus saving us and getting us to heaven. The gospel is about God's power to change lives, to make us different, to make us like Jesus. And you and I cannot make that happen. See, 
we cannot make ourselves more like Jesus. That's God's job. But what I find all too often is, is you and I try to do this Christian walk in our own strength. We try to make changes in our lives in our own strength. And good luck. Can't be done. Because only Jesus can make you like Jesus. Only Jesus can make you strong. Only Jesus can make you loving. Yes, we've got to choose to let him do it. But he does it by his power. Last week in my devotions, I was reading about the slave Onesimus, and I was reading in Colossians, and Paul was sending a letter back to the church in Colossae, a letter we know is the, the letter to Colossians, and he says he's sending it via Tychicus and Onesimus. As far as I can figure out, time-wise, they, they were carrying another letter with them at that time. It was a letter to Philemon. He was the master of Onesimus because Onesimus was a slave that had done Philemon wrong. But Onesimus had found Jesus and he was a changed man. But can't you imagine Tychicus and Onesimus walking into Colossae and the people seeing Onesimus? There he is. There's that bad slave. God that did his master wrong. Look, there he is. All the judging that can go on thinking he's the same as he always had been. So Paul sent a letter with him telling Philemon and everyone else, Onesimus is different now. He's a changed man. And then Paul wrote, as he was writing about Onesimus, he wrote about someone else sending greetings to them from Damas. Damas is also mentioned in Paul's letter to Philemon, and he calls him a fellow laborer, fellow worker, someone I work alongside. And then we find Damas mentioned again in 2 Timothy 4.10. For Damas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. See, we can change the other way, too. The moment we stop letting the Lord change us, we change back to our old ways pretty quickly, our old ways of thinking, our old ways of relating, our old ways of seeking satisfaction. Something happened to Joseph's brother's God had changed them. You can tell because Judas pleased. They're all heart pleased. They're not of the flesh. See, God wants to do much in our lives. And as I, I told you yesterday, it was a wear red day for me. After I'd been slammed the, the third time, and it was still early in the morning, I, I text some friends of mine. We've got this group text, and immediately when there's a prayer request with us, it's boom, 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 there's six of us. You know, I'm praying. Got it. Prayers go up immediately. And I told him, I got to prepare a message for tomorrow, and I can't do it. I just can't do it. And I've only said that one other time in my entire life, and that was 18 years ago, and Debbie Bryson knocked me upside the head on that one, but uh, I didn't tell Debbie about anything yesterday. But you know, I've told you many times, I, I live on 1 Thessalonians 5.24, faithful as he has called you, he will also do it. But yesterday I thought, he's not calling. He can't be calling, you know. I, I just, he's going to give me a break because I, I can't do it. And then one of my friends, actually the daughter of my mentor, Carolyn, who's gone to be with the Lord, she texted me and she said, Mom always leaned on Mark 14.8. And that was a comment that Jesus made in response to his disciples' criticism of the woman who had poured the expensive oil upon him. And he said this, she's done what she could. See, she couldn't keep Jesus from suffering. She couldn't keep Jesus from going to the cross. But she didn't stop there. She did what she could. See, he said, she's done a good thing. She's anointed me for my burial. That's all she could do. And she did what she could. And so my friend said, just do what you can. Just do what you can. See, that's what all God ever asks of you and me. Sometimes we look at our, our failures and our inabilities, and God just says, hey, I'm God. Just do what you can. And I, I prayed, and, and I wasn't in a mood to pray, and when I'm not in a mood to pray, I flip on worship music, you know, and I worship for a while. And, and just like Paul and Silas when they worshiped in prison, you know, prayer results from worshiping. And so then I prayed, and I sat down on my computer, I started typing, and, and here I am, you know, why? 
because I'm so wonderful now, because I did what I could. That's all God asks us to do. And maybe you aren't really aware of this because you didn't see me yesterday. You see me strong tonight. I wasn't strong yesterday. I was a mess yesterday. But see, I know God changes people. Don't ever doubt that. Don't ever think you are stuck with who you are. Because we serve this God that is all about making us like Jesus. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, I beseech you, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Allow God to change you. Because that's what he does. By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove or understand what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And, and what follows these verses is, is a, a list of all the, the gifts that, that God wants to do in us and through us as he transforms us and takes these bodies that aren't good for much and makes them good for my, a whole lot just because we allow God to change us. See, no one, absolutely no one, is beyond God's transforming power. And, and sometimes it's those wear red days that we so dread that God chooses to do his best work. It's just the way he is. And so we walk into those wear red days, those tribulations, and we say, Lord, have at it. Transform me, change me, make me more like Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we, we know who we are. And Lord, outside of your power, we are not transformable. We have tried to transform ourselves so many times. We've tried to be good. We've tried to do right. And we can only do it for a little while. But for all of us, Lord, we, we want your touch. We want your transforming power. So Lord, infuse us with a faith in you and a belief in you that you are able to do all that you need to do through us, Lord. And God, may we face those wear red days in a way that pleases you and honors you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Nothing compares to the promises we have in him. And one of the promises we have in him is that even in those wear red days or years, he wants to use them to transform us. He wants to use them to, to give us hope that will not disappoint. What a glorious God. Go rejoice in him.